So hello you guys, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is an incredibly special one that is near and dear to my heart. So I'm doing the Halloween series where I'm chatting with guests from horror classics, TV shows, films, all that fun stuff. But today's guest is a horror author who I can pinpoint as being one of the main reasons that I fell in love with horror, particularly vampires, why I fell in love with reading, why I think I, why I think I was so drawn to all things like dark and mysterious in later years. Today's author is the lovely Darren Shan, who he, first of all, absolute delight of a man. I met him about 14 years ago at a book signing in my local bookshop. He's just as lovely now as he was then, just as full of love for the craft and, 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 and the energy that he has for his work is the exact same as it was back then. And I still have the book that I got signed at that book signing. Oh my God. Yes, it would have been, it was like, okay, so it was 2011, not 2010, but close enough. And I remember when I was younger being so struck by the fact that one, his last name was O'Shaughnessy, which blew my mind, and two, he's also from Limerick. So seeing somebody make it in the arts, seeing somebody make it in such a creative field, it was hugely impactful on me. And it really did kind of make me feel like, hey, I, I could do something like this. I could do an unusual job that isn't a straight forward, you know, cookie cutter idea of a life or a job. Uh, so yeah, I reached out to Darren, asked him to sit and to chat about all things horror, all things book, all things literature. And crazily enough, <laughs> he agreed. Some of his most notable titles, of course, was the Darren Shan saga or the Cirque de Freak saga. I can't even tell you how mind-blowing this book was, this book series was, to little old me at 13 or 14 getting into it, getting into this world of kind of vampires and mystery and horror. And then the Demonada series, which, oh my god... I I both adored and was terrified of that series. He's a hugely, hugely inspirational author. Um, particularly, like like I said, a huge inspiration to somebody from Ireland. And his books and his works, and especially listening to him speak throughout this interview, because I'm recording this intro after I do the interview, because I always record the intros after I do the interviews, because I'm too nervous to do the intros beforehand. But like, particularly like hearing him speak about um the fact that like, you know, the horror genre, particularly like for young adults and stuff, the market for it, how how it was, uh, in his experience, how he was received, how horror can bring people together, and that feeling of being out of step with other people, being a misfit, which is a theme in many of his books, many of his stories, how it impacts a lot of us. Anyway, a big thank you to Darren for sitting down and talking with me and sharing some fun stories and tidbits. Here is my chat with the lovely Darren Shan. Obviously, you are a massive, massive influence in terms of young adult novels. I want to say I read every book that you ever, not to sound like a freak, I read every book that you ever put out, uh, particularly in my teen and kind of young adult years. But before all of that, before you got into that, how did you find out that this was what you wanted to do, that this was a viable career path for you? I wanted to do it before it was a career option. You know, I love writing stories since I was a very young child, five, six years of age. Uh, I was born in London, which is where my accent comes from, even though I've lived in Limerick since I was six. But I can remember even before I moved back here, um, writing short stories at school. My mum was a primary school teacher. She used to uh, teach in a Skeeton here in Limerick when we moved back. But she taught me to read and write. She realised I had a very active imagination from a young age. And she encouraged me to channel it into stories. So all through my childhood into my early teens, I was, yeah, I'd love writing short stories. Um, I'd love making things up, telling stories to my friends sometimes, doing it for school, homework, if it was an English assignment. And by my sort of, yeah, definitely by my teens, or time I was 13, 14, 15, I knew this is what I wanted to do seriously. I knew this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, if, if I could. Um, obviously, to travel with writing is lots of writers don't get paid a lot of money. You know, if you want to get rich quick, <laughs> you don't get into writing because, you know, there are exceptions. I ended up being one of those exceptions. But, you know, most of us don't make very, very much. It's a very small percentage of us who can even afford to make minimum wage, who can afford to write full time. You know, mm -hmm. if you go into any bookshop, a lot of the books on the shelves will be written by writers who have other jobs. You have to do other things to pay the bills. And writing's never a privilege. Writing's something you've got to earn. You've got to earn the right to have the time to devote to it. And you can't just sit around writing and expect to be paid loads of money for it. You know, most don't. That doesn't happen to most people. So you've got to pay your bills. So, um, yeah, most people have a job. So I was very, very lucky. It did take off for me. I had been able to be a full-time writer for most of my, my adult life. But, yeah, by my sort of early teens, I knew this was a dream I wanted to chase. Whether or not I could make it a reality was another matter. 
but I knew, you know, even if I wasn't getting paid to do it, I'd want to do it in my spare time. Writing is, I often get asked the question, you know, what would I do if I wasn't a writer? Um, I have no idea. It'd be something boring in IT probably, but I would be writing in my weekends. You know, when I had a, a proper job after university, I worked for a couple of years here in Limerick and every weekend I would write. So about two years I worked, a, well, worked a seven day week. The weekend didn't feel like working to me because it was writing is what I was doing as a hobby. And you know, I'm very, very lucky. My hobby is also my job. So we were living in Limerick, so when you were first published? I lived in Limerick all my life, apart from the first six years. Uh, I went to university in London, but even back then I would come home for the holidays. And, you know, it was pretty much six months at uni, six months at home. I'd be working here in Shannon, uh, doing maintenance work in factories in, in the summers um, to pay my bills. So, yeah, no, I've, I've lived in Limerick always. Um, I do travel a lot. I've got a flat. Well, I used to have a flat over in London. I've rented it out since covid but um, because I used to be touring a lot in London, going over there a lot. And I Limerick's my home, Palace Kenry, which is where my parents lived, my grandparents, my great grandparents. This has been my home all my life, and I imagine it always will be. I, f I find it kind of, um, I, I don't know if this has been the experience for you, but for the arts, especially in Limerick, because it's such a sport oriented place, you know what I mean? Like with the hurling and the GAA and all that, I found um, like when I, when I was in school, I al always leaned towards the arts. Uh, and with with what I do now with YouTube and content creation and stuff, you know, f like extended family members or friends from school or whatever, trying to explain what I do is impossible. They don't get it. And my brother, he's in a band. He formed a band during COVID and it's the same kind of thing for him. I feel like the arts isn't taken as seriously as it should be. I think it's the same everywhere. I don't think anyone, I think, I think people who know you find it hard to believe you're going to be a writer. So when I would, you know, I knew since a very young age, I wanted to be a writer. And I'd be, I would never, I'd say this to people who knew me, like, oh, yeah, what, what are you going to do to make money? What, what's going to be your real job? They don't, you know, we think, we have this view of writers and artists and musicians, that it's something that happens to other people, that there's something, you know, we don't, a lot of people don't realise, you know, it's just something that anyone can do, that anyone from anywhere can follow through on and can make, can make happen if they've got the desire to make it happen, if they're prepared to put in the hard work to keep going. Um, and you, you could do it even back in my day, before the internet. It was possible, it was difficult, um, but it, it was doable. I think in these days with the internet, it makes it much more doable. It makes it more possible. I, I, as a teenager, I used to dream of living in other places and being somewhere cool, somewhere it was all <laughs> happening. And, you know, you make it happen. You make your life happen. It's not about being in the right spot at the right time. You know, if you want to be an artist, a writer, a musician, doesn't matter where you live, you make it happen. If you sit around thinking, oh, I wish I was in Paris in the 1960s, that's where I really belong. No, no, you bring that into your life. You, you know, we get a short time on this planet before we're gone. And, you know, and just having dreamed is fine. You know, there's lots of things I dream about which never follow up. But if there's something you're really passionate about, something you really truly want to make happen, you have to make it happen. And if you put in the effort, you can make it happen. Sometimes it does involve travel. There are certain things you have to go to other places to do. Um, you know, if you want to be an astronaut, why do I be very early childhood dreams? You know, there aren't many astronautical programs in Ireland. So if I if that was a career I wanted to follow seriously, then yes, you've got to go somewhere, states where that could happen. Writing's brilliant. You can do it no matter where you are in the world, no matter where you live, you can write. Um what you've got, you don't need any special equipment. I'll write on a, a computer, but you know, you can write by hand just as easily. And yeah, it's it's something you can chase. You can always chase a dream. Never, if, if you say, oh, I can't do this because I live in Limerick, you're just making excuses. It's very easy to make excuses in life. It's very easy not to chase your dreams because it's hard work and you'll get knockbacks and it's difficult and you'll get people mocking you and saying, oh, you can't do that. What are you talking about? Writers only come from the, over the pond. <laughs> no, you, you can make it happen, but you have to work to make it happen. Absolutely. And I have to, I have to ask you about your name because your name is uh, somewhat familiar to me. I remember my mind being blown, being blown when I found out that your name was Darren O'Shaughnessy. Yeah. I, actually, I think you told me that. I don't know how we got onto the topics of last names, but I, I met you at a book signing years ago. Feels like a lifetime ago now. And I don't know. Did you ask me or how it came up? It came up somehow. And I remember you going, oh, that's my name. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how it would have come up, but um, it's something I always, I often talk about. You know, I've never sort of hidden behind my pseudonym. Mm. Uh, the reason I used Darren Shan as a pseudonym, actually, it started with practical concerns. 
Um, I write for adults as well as for teenagers. And the first book ever published actually came out a year before Cert Freak. And that was a book for adult readers. And so it was my first book. So I released it under my real name, Darren O'Shaughnessy. Uh, when I came to write Cert Freak, I decided I wanted to write for children under a different name. I didn't want the confusion of having adult books and children's books under the same name. Because in bookshops, what would happen is the adult books would end up in the children's section. Yeah. Which has happened. My publishers years later convinced me to release a few of my adult books under the Darren Shan umbrella because obviously they sold much better. But yeah, they ended up becoming, in, you know, getting into the, the children's bookshelves because, you know, booksellers, it's fine if you've got a great bookshop like a Mahanese in Limerick where you've got people who are trained in it, mm -hmm. know where to put the books. But, you know, there are lots of other bookshops, especially in um, bookstore, um, chain stores like Tesco's or places like that where they start stopping books. And, you know, they just put books all in the same place. So uh, I want to use it. I use a different name to separate the two. And I immediately thought Darren Shan. My grandfather, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, was always known, even by his children for his life, as Paddy Shan. And so Darren Shan immediately popped in mind. And I liked it. It was a nod to my dead granddad. But it also wasn't so different to my real name that it would be a hard one to remember. It wouldn't be something that I'd have to you know, completely fabricate a name. And it sort of just dropped into my lap, lap nice and easily. And so that's where the Darren Shan comes from. But I'm always Darren O'Shaughnessy. Whenever I travel, you know, my passport is Darren O'Shaughnessy. I never change my name. Whenever I'm talking to someone, I always introduce myself, you know, unless I'm out on tour as Darren Shan. You know, Darren O'Shaughnessy is who I am. Darren Shan is the is the author name. And I must, I must admit, I'm glad I did change it because the books become so so popular. When I'm doing signings, Darren Shan is a lot easier to sign. <laughs> it is <laughs> a Darren lot O'Shaughnessy. I can attest. <laughs> it's funny that you say that you came up with the uh the pen name from your granddad because when I started doing what I do at much smaller scale obviously um my YouTube is still under my name so it's it's Kate O'Shaughnessy but when I when I was making like handles for myself Instagram or Twitter I was like it's it's too long it's too much and my dad's nickname used to be Shocks S-H-O-X so yeah. my my uh my handle on everything is Katie Shocks for that exact reason I was like well it's not my dad and it's a lot easier to remember but with with a large portion of your 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 readers, a large focal point for your demographic being young adult and kind of teens, what made you want to delve into that side of things and explore that? I always wanted to try it. Uh, I always liked reading children's books as I was growing up. And I, I made a leap to adult literature at a very early age. I always loved horror. And when I was, you know, in, in the early to mid-1980s, there were no horror books being, written for, being published for children. So, you know, I was reading Stephen King when I was 10 or 11 years of age, because that's what you did <laughs> back in the 1980s. Obviously, I wouldn't want my children reading that these days, but, you know, back then, that's what you did. James Herbert, whatever the, the horror books were out there. You know, if you loved horror, as I always did, there was no problem seeing horror movies. They'd be on the TV every so often. But horror books, you had to make that leap to add for adult fiction. So, yeah, most of my books I do read have been adult fiction since certainly my very early teens. But I always enjoyed reading children's books as well. Throughout my teens, I'd read Roald Dahl, um, Robert Westall's The Machine Gunner was one of my favourite books, still is. I'd, I always had an interest in books for children and teenagers. And when I was at university, one of, in one of the years in my English degree, I did a year of studying children's literature. So it always been back in my mind, I want, I want to try it one day. Not as a career goal, it was just something I wanted to try. I've written lots of different types of stories. I've tried writing for comics and movies and TV shows when I was first starting out. Novels is where I ended up being most comfortable. But um, I, yeah, I always knew I wanted to try it for children. And one day I had this idea of a boy who meets a vampire at a circus. And the idea of telling a vampire story from a child's point of view fascinated me. Um, I didn't think that had been done before. I remember an interview with a vampire. There was a child vampire in it, but she was a, a small part of the storyline. The idea of making it the child the main focus uh, really, really intrigued me. And I thought, well, since I'm going to be telling it from a child's point of view, why not write it for children and try it? Because yeah, I've written lots of books at, at that stage, um, but they were all for adults. So this is what I thought. I thought this was a chance where I'm going to write for children. And you know, I had no idea, A, if I'd enjoy doing it, B, if I'd be any good at it, or C, if I'd be able to get it published. It was just something I was doing as a sideline. I would actually be working in the daytime on an adult novel. And then in the evenings, I'd do a few pages of this book called Cert de Freak. Um, and actually, one, one of the reasons I was so, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do it at that particular time as well was I had this young cousin who was going to, I think he was going to turn 10 or 11 at that stage. And I wanted to give him a nice birthday present. You know, I had no money. I was on the dole with my parents. I thought, ah, oh, if I finish this book in time, I can print it off and give him this sort of 
first draft novel, which he, which I did, and he still he still has it. He holds on to it as he sort of next day jokes of when he's really when he needs to cash in. But um, I, I did it for fun. It was just a a little side project. I sent it to my agent. I said, I have no idea if you've got any interest in this. You know, um, if you want to have a look, that's fine. If you don't want to look at it, that's fine too. And he read it and he got really excited and he saw the potential in it. Um, he did he did say to me back then. He said, he said two things. He said, but the thing you have got to remember, Darren, is children's books don't make any money. And this is nineteen ninety seven when I sent the first draft of Search for Future. He said, children's books, you know, you don't make any money, fast money. If it's a good children's book, over a lot of time it will sell steadily and you'll make a nice steady income over a long period. But, you know, in the short run, kids' books don't make any money. I said, okay. And, I, and then I asked him, do you have any other children's authors on your books? He said, just, just one, this young lady who just published the first book, J.K. Rowling. <laughs> so his sort of view of children's books changed over the next few years. Uh, you do need lucky breaks as an author. As I said earlier, writing is hard work. If you want to chase a dream, if you chase it and put the hard work in, you know, you will get to the point where you can make the dream come true to a certain extent. So my idea, goal as a writer was be to, was to tell the best stories I could, to write the very best books that I could, to increase my skills over time and hard work, to be a good writer. But when it comes to sales, you can't control that. You can't control what the market is going to be interested in. Um, and I was very lucky with Certain Freak. I hit the market at what became just the right moment. It wasn't the right moment in 1997. Uh, every publisher at Action UK turned Search Freak down when my agent first took it to them. Nobody wanted to touch it with a barge pole. Um, Hub Collins did take it on at that time. The editor, we, my agent arranged a few meetings. Uh, the editor there read it a second time. When she read it a second time, she thought, actually, there's some potential in this. So she actually signed it up. She then went off to have uh, twin babies and ne never returned to a job. Her replacement read the book and was, why the hell have we brought this? <laughs> Tried to sell it back to us, but my agent said, no, you bought it, you're stuck with it. So they actually sat on it for a couple of years. They didn't do anything with it. It was bought late 1997, early 1998. wasn't actually published until January 2000. But in those two years, Harry Potter obviously became this huge, storming, game-changing behemoth. And my agent was Harry Potter's agent, uh, J.K. Rowling's agent. Right. So the publishers started thinking, well, hang on, we've got this project that Christopher Little has brought to us. He brought, they actually turned down Harry Potter at HarperCollins. They thought, well, maybe he's sort of, maybe he's, maybe he's right about this. He was right about Harry Potter. Maybe he's right about this as well. And so they, they put a bit of push into it. They, they put it out there. They start promoting it heavily. And yeah, and it grew. Um, but yeah, uh, without Harry Potter, maybe they would have just not published the book at all. Maybe they would have done nothing with it. Maybe they would have killed it. You, you need luck. In terms of careers and, you know, selling su uh, substantial volumes of your books or whatever it is you might be doing, you do need lucky breaks in life. And it sounds ridiculous, you know, to think that Stephen King or J.K. Rowling or uh, Darren Shea never needed a lucky break. Yeah, you would like to think that talent would always shine through. It, it doesn't. There are loads of great writers whose books never sell very many copies, loads of great artists whose work never sells, loads of great musicians who never sell, you know, millions of copies, millions of CDs or I'm still thinking CDs, I'm old school. But um, <laughs> yeah, you've, got, you've got to work hard. If you've got a dream of a chase in life, you've got to work hard to chase it. You do need a bit of luck along the way as well if you're going to have commercial success. You got, I always say to young writers, success is how you judge it. Your goal should be to do the very best work you can do. But it's always, everyone obviously, well, most people like the idea of their work being hugely popular as well. But that's something you can't control. That will happen or won't happen. Um, it's in the bit of the gods it's it's crazy though how quickly something can turn that it can go from ah well you know children's books we don't know we don't really get the concept of this to like you said well i guess it wasn't quick it was a three or four year process but that all, almost seemingly like overnight that it was suddenly harry potter took off and then your books took off and then suddenly there was this big market for it when people would have thought that impossible a few years before a lot of it is to do with publicity and the money they pump in now, Certain Freak, it didn't take off suddenly. It didn't like go to bestseller status overnight here in, the, uh, here in Ireland. Well, Ireland. Ireland did very well from the start. But Ireland's a small market, and you know, I was an Irish boy, and I was going around here, all just libraries and schools. But like in the UK, it was three or four years before the books really started to um, get anywhere near the top of the bestseller lists, the children's charts. It wasn't really until my second series with Demonata that you know, I had my first number one bestseller. It was, um, it was word of mouth, which is how children's books traditionally and still do mostly evolve and, and get build traction um you know children's books the way it happens you know if you're lucky a kid will read it like it recommend it to their friends 
friends recommend it. It's a snowball effect. And that happened in the UK. We saw it building, building, building. The books, there are lots of books which could be popular, but they never get past the sort of stumbling block at the beginning of how do you make people aware that this exists. Mm. And obviously, if publishers go and start putting covers on billboards and get TV advertising and you know, really push it, that will help people be, oh, I've, that book looks interesting. I'll give it a go. They don't really do that with children's books. They started doing it after Harry Potter to an extent. They started giving them a bit more of a push, you know, um, promoting them more aggressively. But generally speaking, in, in the publishing world, the big money goes on adult books. That's where they will do, you know, promoting their adult authors, whoever they might be, maybe Vinci, Cecilia Hearn, Stephen King, whoever's their sort of big adult author. And the children's books, you know, it, well, they look down us a bit, you know, being honest, you know, the publishing houses, even though children's books play, play a huge role in the success of a publishing house. You know, something like The Hobbit, for instance, by Tolkien, you know, that will over the decades have made a fortune for, um, I think, Hub Collins published that as well. But they still have this sort of thing that, oh, your yeah, kids' books, you know, it's not really a serious branch of the literary business. And, you know, it can drive you bad if you, if you let it, but I don't worry about it too much, you know. Um, but, yeah, but, but that's why a lot of children's books... They don't get the same. They don't get the same awareness that adult books will get. They do depend a lot on playground talk. Um, and the days, obviously, you know, through the internet, or, you know, talking about it, recommend it to your friends. It's it's a lot of uh, word of mouth that gets a children's book off the ground and, and going in long term. That's why my, when my agent said to me, "Yo, know, kids' books don't make money." What he was saying was, in the short term, it don't. In the long term, a good children's book can outlast and outsell a lot of adult books. You, know, you go back to twenty five years ago when Search Freak first came out, and if you were to look at the list of the top 50 adult bestsellers that year, I suspect a lot of those would be out of print now. Um, if you look at the top 50 children's bestsellers, I would guess the vast majority of those would still be in print and still selling away nicely. I mean, yeah, and I think it's because a big part of it too is like the longevity of when you find something as a child or a young adult, you latch onto it. Uh, well, speaking for myself, I'm the type of person who, if I have loved something once, Generally, I'll love it forever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and I think we're most excited in our life. I think when we're kids and teenagers, when yeah. we're discovering things for the first time and they're first happening to us, it's very hard. You know, I'm, I'm 52 now. It's very hard to recapture the thrill of you know reading my first Stephen King novel, of reading Machine Gunners for the first time, of the Chocolate War for the first time, of hearing Smiths for the first time. Yeah, you know, it's um there are things that have yeah you know, as we're growing up. We, ex we experience the world and we start to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we discover things for the first time and we start to find out who we are. And it's one of the things I've always liked about children's books, but the impact they can have on a reader. I think it is far more. Yeah, I still love books today. I still read books. There are still books that really excite me and that fascinate me and intrigue me. But, yeah, it's been a long time since I latched onto a book the way I did when I was 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age, where it sort of blew my mind and changed my world and, you know, help define who I was as a person. And you get to your 50s, you're pretty much defined by that stage, or <laughs> should be. But, you know, when you're a teenager, a child and a teenager, you're still discovering yourself. You're still going in all these different directions. You're still an open slate in many ways. And it's a it's a brilliant, terrifying time of our lives. Um, you know, it's the best, as the old Dickens line goes, it's the best of time, times, it's the worst of times. It's a very confusing time of our lives, but it also can be this hugely brilliant, stimulating time as well. And it's one of the things I've, it's why I've kept on doing the children's books or tapping into that because I love it. You know, when I tour, tour around now and, you know, meet meet kids or meet adults like yourself who read the books and never kids and they're still, 20 years later, they're still buzzing about it. Go, wow, that book, you know, that's such a big impact on me. It's just, it's the best feeling. You know, it's what he got into this business for. It's what I always dreamed of when I was a teenager you know, scribbling away in my notepad, hoping that one day, you know, what would success be? I mean, it wasn't, you know, the money and all those nice things. It was that connection with the readers. Mm -hmm. Having someone come up and say, wow, that story really, really moved me. It made me cry. It made me scream. It made me puke, whatever it might be. <laughs> um, that, you know, that's the, it's, it's, it's the best thing. It's absolutely amazing when, when the book connects with people like that. And um, I'd be very, very lucky that quite a few of my books, books did that. It, it's funny because I remember one of my first um, exposure, I guess, and my first memory of being exposed to books and reading was obviously I would have been. OK, maybe it wasn't when it was new because I was born in 96, but I would have been about four or five. My mom read me Harry Potter. 
eased me in that kind of way. And I was like, okay, I can handle this. I might be able to read the second one by myself. Kind of, it kind of snowballed from there. And then I, I have the vivid memory of my great grandmother, which would have been my mom's mom's mom, <laughs> right? She passed. And I remember my mom telling me the story of her favorite thing to do was read. Every night she'd get into bed with a good book and a little box of chocolates. So I thought that is the epitome of like being a grown up is getting into bed with your books and your chocolate. So my mom brought me out to the bookshop, out in the Crescent, and was like, any book within reason for a kid, any book you want will get you one and will get you a little box of chocolates. And it was Cirque de Freak. And I remember getting the books. And like I said, I was an all or nothing kind of kid. So got the first one and was like, I have to read all of these. And my mom Bless her. She supports everything I do. Did. She got like the whole series for me. And I was just transfixed by this idea of like what seemed to be such an adult pastime reading, being smart, you know, like, yes, I can understand this, this book, but also that I could see so much of myself in it as a, as a teen or a young adult. But it is a, it's a big series. It's like 12 books. When you started out writing them, did you have the end in mind? Did you know where certain characters were going to go? Or was it a book-by-book -book case? Actually, uh, well, not quite book-by-book -book case. Um, it was over the course of the first three books that I figured out the, oh, the basic bones of what would become the, the final structure. Mm. Um, obviously, when I started start the first book, as I said earlier, it was just um, the first time I'd ever written a book for children. I didn't know if I'd enjoy it, if I'd be any good at it. I wasn't sure if I'd finish it or if I'd get it published. I knew how, I knew how the first one would end. Yeah, the first one ended. It, it tells its story nicely, but it is also leaves the option for some sequels. So I was by the time I got to the end of the first draft, I was thinking, yeah, I really like this. I'd like to do a few more books. I thought maybe another three, four books, just your chart in this kid's next adventures in this world of vampires. And I wrote the second book, Vampire's Assistant. And it was really when I was planning the third book, Tunnels of Blood, that the structure began to fall into place for me, and I began to realise there was a much bigger story to be uncovered. And so by the time I got to the end of Tunnels of Blood, I was I had a, a rough map pretty much in mind. It was still very rough. There was lots of things to fill in, but I knew where I wanted to go. I knew I wanted to go into delve deeper into this world of vampires and look at what their society was like. I mean, the first book, really, there's only one vampire we get to see well. Mm -hmm. and there's no one who comes to it very briefly, but, you know, it's all this boy and this old vampire. And then after the third book, it opens up and we meet hundreds of vampires. And so, yeah, but by the end of the third book, I had a pretty good idea that I was on something big, that it was going to be a big story, that there were going to be all these different movements and story arcs within it. But I didn't know exactly how it was going to plot out. I actually thought it were going to be more books. I originally planned to write between 20 and 24. So if you come to see me on tour back in you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, you know, whenever anyone asked me how long is this series going to be, I was saying, oh, it's going to be 20 or 24 books. I thought it was going to be um, half set in our modern world, Mm -hmm. But half of it was going to, then going to be set in a future world. There's this uh, book, book 10, Lake of Souls, where we get to glimpse this sort of futuristic, nightmarish, desolate world. And that was going to be the setting for the second half of the story. It was going to be this sort of big, massive, two, two sort of like two volume storyline. When I got, when I was getting close to the end of what would have been volume one, I realised it was a coming of age story. And Darren Shan, the character, like you were saying there, find, recognise yourself in the book. He was a teenager. He was a boy going through to his teenage years. And that's what it was. It was dressed up as this sort of other sort of tale all about vampires and um, various things. But at heart, it was a coming of age story about this boy learning to become a grown up, learning to become an adult, learning to stand on his own two feet, find out who he was and how he was going to make his way in the world. And I realised, yeah, once I got to the end of that arc of his story, it needed to end. Um, if I took it forward... He was an adult. I did write the first book of what would have been about the second half, but his voice was different. He was an adult speaking now. And I just didn't feel that children would connect with him as strongly as they had done before that. I think Darren Shander's character story had come to its natural conclusion. And it was a it was a difficult thing for me to do because, you know, I'd been saying it's going to be 20, 24 books. And I had it planned out. Yeah, you know, I looked a bit of a, an ass for stopping it <laughs> suddenly. But I'll always go where the story leads me. I'll always do what the story demands to be done. And Darren Shan's story wanted to end at that point in time. And even though financially it was crazy because, you know, that was by that stage, I knew I was onto a good thing. It was, you know, selling loads, loads of books. If I continued, that would have been, you know, X number of million sales extra. But yeah, you know, I never think of the market. I never think of the commercial side of things. I write stories 
but I want to write stories that move me, stories that I hope will move other people. And when I feel the story is done, I walk away. I tend not to be, I tend not to come back to projects, but I don't, I don't come back to projects from a commercial point of view. I don't do sequels and pre tie-ins. I've done it once with Mr. Krepsley. I wrote four books about Mr. Krepsley's life before he met Darren. He's the main vampire in the cert three books. Um, that was just because I loved his character so much and I just needed to know what his story was before he met Darren. But generally speaking, yeah, I'm not much one of the times. I'm, mm. I don't want to be making my money by writing books that I don't want to be writing. Uh, writing for me has always been a pure pursuit, something that I've done for fun, something that I've done for enjoyment. You know, if I, going back to my early 20s, mid 20s, I can remember sending, um, before I got my agent, I sent a few of my books into some uh, into a few publishers and you, know, which you should never do as a writer because you, you don't get anywhere but one editor at a publishing house did actually read a few of the books that i sent to her and she was very nice and she could be very good supportive uh criticism and I, I don't forget one of the things she said was you know if you don't write these sort of fantastical stories if you just write a straightforward thriller you would get published definitely because you're writing very strong but yeah you know, you're writing all these weird angles and you just need to focus on you know a normal straight up thriller but i, I didn't want to do that to me that would have been pointless. Uh, I'd, if, if I had to make money, I would go and get a job and I'd write my spare time and make it work that way. I'd rather be writing my own odd, weird little books, making nothing and spending my writing time doing work I didn't want to do. And there's nothing wrong. There's lots of writers who, will, who are happy to do that, who you know, who will look for a, a niche in the market that they can exploit and will write books for that niche. But I, I can never write that way. For me, it's just I put my soul into books and I write the sort of stories that I just feel compelled to write but um so mr crepsley was the the only time i've sort of broken that rule because i just i needed to i wanted to know what his story was but generally speaking it's not something i'd, I'd be a big fan of that's a very interesting take because especially in today's day and age i feel like nostalgia is a major selling point and i i would have a feeling that if you did bring out maybe even an adult series of like where darren is now aimed towards people like me that would have grown up on the books you could be damn sure I'd be first in line to be like, yeah, what is he up to now? <laughs> I know, but uh, I'd, I'd look at it. And obviously, you know, loads of people are doing that. You know, Marvel are doing that with all the yeah. films. Star Wars are doing that. But I, I can remember the first, when the first Star Wars trilogy was finished, well, what, 1983. And for years and years, 20-odd 20, 20 years, we had nothing. No sequels, no prequels, no tie-ins. Not on the movie front, anyway. Um, it gave it a real mythos i think one of the reasons star wars became so massive over those following decades was those first three films stood pristine and when he went back and started doing the extra films it's lost a bit of that luster you know um, it's still huge obviously but you know i think back then it was all, almost mystical because you, know, you only had three films that was it and it was special yeah. and obviously you know there's the commercial side of things and you know big companies they have to make their money and they want to to cash in on these jokes but as creators especially writers we have the choice to make we didn't we can choose not to do that i've done very very nicely out of my books i've sold lots and lots of books millions of copies i've made quite a lot of money i could be making more money doing you know even more cash into stuff i i, I don't need extra money you know, what i need is more really good books that i love that, to, to write so um that, that's that's for me i mean i've been very fortunate i'm in a position where i'm able to do that the books took off i've done well now I've got two kids now. You know, if my books weren't doing very well, I didn't have enough money and I had to make that decision. Yeah, I wouldn't be precious about it. You know, if I had to write commercially to put food on the kids' table, I'd do that. You know, if that meant going in and writing a few Star Wars movies, yay, I'd be up for it. <laughs> but um, if, if you have the choice, you know, we don't have to be greedy. You know, as creators, we don't have to chase every penny if we don't need to. And if you don't need to, you know, chase the, chase the, the stories. Try and create. I'm still there trying to come up with new ideas, trying to put, trying to come up with fresh stories to tell. I'm not looking back and thinking, okay, how can I do the saga of Dan Shanigan? How can mm -hmm. I do it with, you know, a different monster, but same story structure, but do it with zombies instead of, of vampires. Um, you know, I've, I've written a few other long series, the Demonata, my zombie series, but structurally they were completely different. Thematically, they were completely different. They did very different things, they went in different directions. I'm not one of these writers who can do the same thing over and over. I have huge respect for writers who can. Um, Ina Blyton, a, a great example. You know, she, you're the Secret Seven, you're the Famous Five. You know, she could do that, and she did it very, very well. Um, Terry Pratchett, one of my favourite authors, you know, he can do the same world over and over, different things. But um, 
you know, that's that's not where I go. I like the new challenges. I like trying different things. Uh, as a writer, I think you need to find if you can, if you can what interests you and pursue that. If you're able to do that, then the sort sort whatever sort of books you want to tell would be the right books to tell. But if you're doing something just for the money, I don't know, I think it's a bit, a bit soulless. And it comes across through the art as well. If the love and the passion isn't there, it bleeds through to the art to an extent. It usually does. You like, you like to think that it does. But um, at the same time, there are lots of these commercial books that sell in huge amounts and that people enjoy. So um, I've never snooty about it. You know, I've never looked down on another writer who's made those choices and is doing those sorts of, of books. It's just, for me, that's not where my head is at. It's not where my heart is. Um, with, with the Cirque du Freak series then, you have this this motley crew of misfits that don't fit in anywhere, but they do with each other. The concept for that, I think, is so gorgeous, especially like, like I said, if you're viewing it through the lens of a young teen or an adult, everybody feels that way. Everyone feels like, yeah, I fit in nowhere, but these could be my friends. This could be my group, my clan. Uh, but yeah, where did the idea for that originate? And the names. Oh my God, some of the names. Where did you come up with the names? So the, the names come from different places. The names, sometimes there'll be people I know. A lot of characters in my books are named after real people. Um, particularly from the Demon Archer onwards. I didn't put so much in the Star Grand Show, but I do have some characters in there. But um, yeah, in a lot of my later books, I, I'll name characters after my friends and family members. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, back then, I'd play around with words. So for instance, Mr. Krepsley. Originally, his stage name was going to be Mr. Creepy. Mr. Creepy and his performing tarantula man doctor. And I thought, that sounds a bit too childish. But I like the sound of Creepy. So I played around with it, and that's where Krepsley came from. Um, there were times I might, I'd look through a, a movie guidebook. I'm a big movie fan. I'd always have a, a movie guidebook by my side. And I might flick through that and find some sort of odd name that I might use or maybe tweak a few letters to make it even odder. I think when you were writing, when I was writing about bizarre creatures like vampires and demons, mm. it was natural to have sort of weird names. They slotted into those universes quite quite nicely. In my more slightly realistic books, like the zombie, even though it's about the zombie apocalypse, you know, it doesn't involve magic. So mm. I sort of kept the names more believable in that, more realistic sort of names. But yeah, with the Saga and Shan, you know, I, I just thought, yeah, let's just sort of come up with weird stuff. And everyone, but yeah, lots of names. They were fun. I'm not really sure, but just sort of come, in, come, in, come from different places. As for, um, you know, how it all originated, I think, you know, I certainly felt like a freak growing up. I felt like I was, yeah, I had a few very, very good friends, but, you know, I loved books. I loved reading horror and fantasy. I loved indie bands like the Smiths and the Go-Betweens, uh, Pixies. Obviously, Pixies become much bigger since then, but yeah, back in the 80s, yeah. I was a bit of an outlier. I liked the weird stuff. I liked the things that the mainstream weren't going to do. You know, Wham! was not my thing. Yeah, <laughs> so I was like, yeah obviously, it's good music. Yeah. I, I can enjoy it much more nowadays, but in the 1980s, I was stridently anti-Wham! or anti you know, that sort of popular stuff. I liked the grungy stuff, the weird stuff, the unusual things. Um, it's just what I was drawn to. I was drawn to things that were different. But uh, you can always, one of the things I've found as an adult, as going through life, you can always find your people in this world. You know, I feel really sorry for people who lose track of that, you know, kids sometimes. And, you know, teenage, teenage years can be hard. They can be difficult. And, you know, so we lose some of our teenagers. They take their lives. And um, you don't need to, if you hold in there, you will find people. You will find your tribe out there. You just have to keep going. Um, they seem, teenage years seem to last forever. It's a tiny part of your life. It's a handful of years you know you get to my age 52 it's hard to even rem remember those years why the opinion of your peers matters so much why you cared if your teacher tore you some <laughs> a second hole in class um but it's hard as a teenager to see the big picture of your life you know you, you, you're not yet a fully formed adult you don't yet realize that there are loads of great people out there people like you who you can discover who will love you for who you are and what you are and so I want to write a book that was you know, saying to younger me, as well as to my readers, you know, you'll always find your people. Um, you know, this world is full of freaks. There's nothing wrong with being a freak. It's great to be a freak. There are loads of freaks out there and you will find them. Now, what happens at what dark corners of the world you might end up in. If you get swept away by a vampire and you have to drink blood and you're at night, you will still find people who will be your best friends in life. And it's, it's something that runs through most of my books. Um, the Demonata. Was a, had a similar sort of standpoint, you know, Lord Loss. Yeah, it's about this boy who fights a big, big demon and all, all that sort of magic side of thing. Yeah, it's a cool book. It's fun. It's exciting. But it's also, at its heart, it's about a boy who loses his family in this tragic accident and finds a way to put his life back together and carry on. It's the message 
that comes through in all my books. And it's the message reason that I, it's the reason I think why my books haven't really been banned very widely. When so when Cert the Freak back in 1997, when we, were, when we were trying to sell it, one of the reasons publishers didn't want to touch it was they thought it was too dark, but it was too grisly, that it would be banned, teachers and librarians would come out in arms against it and demand it not be stopped in bookshops. But that didn't happen because that voice, that message, uh, it's it's about children overcoming obstacles, finding their way through the world. That's what my books have all been about. Uh, my, all my children's books, certainly. And that's what came through. And, you know, the biggest supporters, some of my biggest supporters in those early years, and even now, all these years later, were teachers and librarians who read it and saw that in it and who gave the books to their kids who realised, look, there's children there, and, you know, they're not, in, they're not engaged in sports, you know, they're not interested in mathematics and sciences and stuff. Maybe they'll like reading about this little boy who runs into a vampire. Maybe, let's see if that does. And it, and, and they work wonders. You know, it's, um, you know, books can be a huge, huge important part of our life. They're there for entertainment, but they can also help us in our dark times. They can help us find connections with the world or to, to search for those connections. They can give us hope that, okay, I might be in a dark place. I might not know where I'm going, but this kid was in a dark place. He didn't know where he was going and he, and he hung in there and he came through good in the end. And maybe that can happen with me as well. And, you know, that's sort of, um, yeah, that, that, that's sort of, for me, that's a huge part of, of, of my books. It definitely comes across as well, because like you said, I think particularly in those years as well, there, you don't know what you're searching for until it's pointed out to you in certain ways. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you might feel a little bit lost or untethered and then you read a book where you see yourself reflected and you're like, oh, OK, I just need this or I need to do that. And, and it can be such a huge crutch. But you brought up Lord Loss and I just I have to touch on that for a minute because I adored the Demon Atta series when I got a bit older. Right. I went through the Cirque de Freak series and went next one. Give me went straight into Demon Atta. I don't. I don't know, is it because I was afraid of wolves and werewolves? I have it because of my dad. It's a long story involving the film Dog Soldiers. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> You know yes. that film? Yeah. So picked up Lord Loss and the cover, it's just the cover. I hadn't even started it, gave me nightmares. So I was like, we'll, we'll put that to the back of the bookcase. We can't see it for another year or two. I did end up reading it and adoring it because it is... It feels darker, it feels kind of gorier, but it feels a little bit more mature. And when you were shifting gears into the Imanado series, was that a conscious effort that you had? That, right, I want to take that next step to kind of between teen and adulthood. Because a certain freak was an unusual one. It started out, Darren was quite young. He was, I never gave his age, but he was about 10, 11 sort of, mm. sort of age group. And I did write with that. I, I never write with an audience in mind, but I was thinking about myself when I was that sort of age, and I was writing for that sort of younger version of me. With Lord Loss, I did decide to move it up a bit. Um, I don't think the saga of Darren Shannon was a horror series. It was about vampires, so it got sold in most territories as horror. But I always felt it's not really horror. Yeah, it's dark elements to it. But yeah, more than anything else, it's an action-adventure series. Mm. So I thought, yeah, but let, let, let's... All right, I've, I've been sold out as a horror writer. Let's go for it. Let's see how far I can push things and what, what, what I can get away with. Because yeah, I've always loved horror. And um, but yeah, writing for kids and teenagers, there are lines that are very, very difficult to cross. You know, certain freak in 1997 was deemed to have crossed loads of those lines. One of the reasons we had so much trouble getting it published. So I thought, well, now that I was in there and I was in my groove and, you know, I was being this published author and the books were starting to do really well. I thought, yeah, let's, let's see if I can push it a little bit further and see where we can get, where we can go. And uh, it, it was incredible. Uh, I, I learned my lesson with, with book one. In um, in chapter two of book one, Lord Loss, uh, the main character, Grubbs Grady, walks into a bedroom and mm -hmm. sees his parents and sister ripped apart by demons. And in the first draft of that book, he walks in and there's a body hanging upside down from the ceiling with its head chopped off and blood dripping to the floor from the gaping red O of the neck. In the first draft, that was his mum. And my editor read it and she was horrified. She said, Darren, I love this book, but chapter two, you've got to really sort of make big changes here. I said, yeah, no worries, leave it with me. I only changed one thing. I swapped it to his dad. And the body hung upside down with his dad. That was absolutely fine. And they were fine with it then? <laughs> well, see, I, I was sort of, uh, I was a bit, bit sneaky. I knew when she read it a second time, it wouldn't be as shocking as it was the first time. So I knew I'd probably get away with a lot. So I thought if I do one thing that's, you know, visually different. And yeah, so yeah, if you want to uh, be a horror writer for kids, just go easy on the mummies and everything else. Leave them alone. Do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh my god. But with with the with the visuals then as well, a lot of your covers they're very visually striking. And how much creative say do you get in that? Do you get to choose the art? I would be closely involved with it back, back then. Um, books were published in lots of different countries around the world. And in lots of countries, I wouldn't have been. But in the UK, that was my primary market. Mm. So, And America was a big market as well. And they were the two where I would, would be closely involved in choosing the covers. So, yeah, so basically what we would do, um, I would discuss with my editor what might go on the cover. I and mean, then they would go and find the authors, uh, sorry, find the artists. So I think with the demon artist, it was a guy called Mel Grant who did those, the hardcover ones. Um, the first print covers and so they went and found him and then he would do a picture send it back to me and usually it was absolutely fine but sometimes I would go back and I'd say oh this needs to be tweaked or you know could we change this but um, yeah no he sort of he, he got into it he got sort of the vibe very very quickly he was a really good match which publishers will, will, always, will always try to do they'll try and find a good editor will look for an artist who will match the material of a book and yeah with Mel they, they found a really really good match he, he was excellent I thought absolutely they're still to this day probably one of my favorite covers for any book series just the use of color not even the imagery more so the color it's just so striking um but but as an author <clears throat> you create these characters in these worlds i imagine they're very close to you because they're yours so then when along comes maybe a screen adaptation for a film or a show obviously Cirque de Freak got made into a film the vampire's assistant what was it like telling your family and friends around you it's going to be a film. Nice. It was um, it it, it being linked to being a movie almost from the very beginning. Um, going back to Lucky Breaks because of the Harry Potter sort of uh, connection. Uh, the the producer of the Harry Potter films, David Heyman, read Certain Freak very early on. I think even before it was published, and he got Warner Brothers Studios at the time to, to option it. So Certain Freak was optioned very very early, not long after it was first printed. Uh, that didn't work out in the end. He wasn't able to get scripts produced that you know, they were happy to go forwards with. So the rights ended up coming back to us and being bought by Universal firm down the line. And we ended up making the movie. Um, they're out on option again at the moment now. There's another company in the States who are trying to get it going as a TV series. So um, it wasn't like it suddenly just happened. Um, there was the original option and there was all the excitement of that. Mm -hmm. Then that faded. Then the other option came in and that sort of went ahead. It, it was really cool. It was when we had the, the European launch party was here in Nimerick. I the Omniplex, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the Omniplex, yeah. So yeah. I, sort of, um, I don't put my foot down often with these things, usually the publishers, but I did say to them, look, I'd really love it if you do it here in Nimerick, you know, home turf. I can go along and, you know, because I used to go there all the time watching films. So it was, yeah. you know, a real buzz for me to turn up in my local cinema with, well, I, I say my film. It wasn't really my film. Um, it, it was very, very different. I wasn't involved with Cert Freak at, at all. Um, the script writer didn't seek my... Uh, involvement, then the director took over, he rewrote the script and did it again. He wasn't interested in having me involved. So I had nothing to do with it, which is why it's so different to the books. I do enjoy it on its own terms. It's a, yeah, it's a good little film. I, I like it, uh, honestly. But yeah, it wasn't my story. Um, I'm hoping if it gets done for TV now, that they will stick closer to the, the books, although they haven't looked to involve me so far. So I suspect it could end up being a different beast as well. Uh, Demon Arta actually is under option. Um, there's two young guys over in the, in England who are working on it, and they are looking to involve me. I've met them a few times, and they they want me to look at the scripts and work on the scripts with them. So if we can get that off the ground, we could finally have a Darren Shan project, which does actually have Darren Shan involved in it. But usually they don't, and I understand that, and I've no problem with that. Um, I love movies. You know, I love books as much as I love books. I love movies. Uh, I've grown up on both. Each is precious to me. Um, I did. I always meant to try and work in the movie industry. I was meant to get going on scripts, but never quite got round to it. Not yet, anyway. But um, yeah, I think I like it when the movie maker has a vision and has an idea and wants to do things in a certain way. You know, I think the best films are made by people who are passionate, who aren't just trying to do you know replicate the success of a book. People who take it on and do different things with the story. So I've absolutely no problem with that. Um, it, it would be lovely if I'm involved, as I was, as I am currently with, with Demon Arta. But, you know, I can understand it when they don't involve me. I think sometimes that they make mistakes by not involving the authors more. You know, when they sort of, if they'd brought a certain freak, certain freak to me, we could have worked it together. And even for it being very different, there were things I could have suggested which mm. might have helped make it uh, more of a success than it turned out to be. Because it veered off so different to the books, I think they lost some of what made the book special. But it's the way the business works. I think if you sell the rights to a book, you lose control over those rights. 
one of the things I love as an author is as a writer, you have absolute complete control over what ends up in a book. Uh, in the movie world, in the TV world, it just isn't the case. You know, the reality is that isn't the case. You know, directors sometimes will get final cut over a movie. I've never ever heard of an, a writer having final cut of a movie. It just doesn't happen. And so I think you either don't sell the rights at all and just keep it pure for yourself. But if you do sell them, you sort of got to send it out there and let it off. And yeah, keep your fingers crossed that they do a nice job, that they stay faithful to the books. But if they don't, you know, I don't really think you can do too much million about it because that's the way the world works. I, I actually rewatched it recently and um, I still enjoyed it. Obviously, it's very different. I think they take, do they take the first three books for the, throughout the film and they kind of mash it? And they even, they took a few little things from later books yeah. as well. It was... I think they lacked the darkness of the books. And I think that was its biggest mistake. Mm. You know, they cut out the character of Sam Grest, mm. who that gave a lot of heart to the, the first to book two and book three and the way they succeeded as they did with readers. And yeah, I think they sort of tried to be a bit too comedic with, with it. I think if it'd been a bit braver and gone as dark as I had with the books, yeah. I think they, they probably would have fared better. But yeah. It's, yeah, it's an odd little film. There's nothing else out there quite like Sir the Freak. If you go, I got a lot of new readers on the back of it, people who'd never heard of the books, who saw the film, liked it, and then came and discovered this much bigger, wider world of the books. Um, I understand, you know, there are people who read the books, and if you go that, that way, you read the books first, then you realise all the things they cut out and all the differences. And I understand if for some readers that's just heresy and they don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. But uh, honestly, it, uh, honestly, I wasn't ever tied by my contract to having to support the film. You know, sometimes in the contract, they'll say, oh, you can't say anything negative about it. But yeah. They never, but that, that clause was in my contract. So if I had hated it, I was perfectly free to slag it off as much as I wanted. Uh, and and yeah, at this stage, it's been out so long, you know, it, it would make no difference. But no, I genuinely do like the film. I mean, yeah, look, I, I think I think when, when, especially with readers, you become so like intertwined with the source material, there can be this feeling of protectiveness when you hear an adaptation is being made I mean we saw it with um, I guess you could use Lord of the Rings I mean The Rings of Power came out recently and I feel like is it the Silmarillion Silmarillion they're, yeah, yeah. they're trying to buy the rights to that now I have read that book so I'm like do you know how, how would that work on a screen I don't know but I yeah. feel like with something like the Demonata series or even with the Cirque de Freak series a miniseries could be perfect for it and I, I did, I, I was reading something about that, about the two lads that are, um, are they working on the script or they're helping co-create it for the Demonada series? Yeah, so they're basically, well, showrunners. As the, as the, so yeah, they're, 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 but they're writing the scripts at the moment. So they're writing trial scripts. And they've taken the sort of first, well, book one, book two and book four, which introduced mm -hmm. the three narrators. And they're doing scripts for each of those. And then we're going to look at, you know, what's the best way to produce, to proceed with it? Because it's a very unusual structure with Demonata. It's not a linear story. So, you know, will they do, will they look to do season one just as Lord Loss? Or will they look to take elements from the three different characters and mix them up? And at the moment, they're sort of playing around with various options. So they're um, looking at different ways that they might do it, of how it might be structured. And um, yeah, so I haven't seen, they're very, they're very close to sharing the work with me. I haven't seen it yet. But um, yeah, I know they're sort of firing away on full cylinders. So hopefully in the next few weeks, I'm going to have a, be able to cast my eye on it and then we'll have some chats and ultimately it'll be, the, it'll be their decision. You know, I, I'm delighted that they're looking to involve me. Um, I've met with them, as I said, but yeah, I have said to them, these are my thoughts. You're completely free to ignore them. You, you, you can involve me as much as you want. I'll try and help you, but I won't stand in your way. If, you, if I say, I, I think it should be done this way, you say, no, I'll do it that way. I'll, they'll have my full backing to do it their, their way. I feel like there's a huge market for that. And we saw it recently with, um, it was Goosebumps, there was a mini series of Goosebumps that came out, and I think it was uh, three or four different books. I think throughout the season was dealt with and interviewed the vampire as well. It was made into a TV show, and the first two seasons I think were book one. So there is there's some there's something in the water at the moment with ho with horror TV shows. Um, well, we always bubble up in the end. Yeah, I mean the horror always bubbles through the cracks. They try to paper us over, but we keep coming back because people want us. People want yeah. to go get lost in something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It goes through phases where it sort of blows hot and cold with the public. You know, if you get too much, it's like we're seeing with the Marvel films at the moment. If you get too much of a good thing, it stops being a good thing. So sometimes you do need those little lulls. But yeah, horror, I think some of the earliest stories ever told 
going back to the Stone Age sort of time, came and get a quake to dwellers. They were definitely horror stories. You know, you hear noises out in the dark. What might it be? What might be making those noises? Yeah. You know, I, I think horror has played a huge role in our development as a, a species. And for you, being somebody who lives in horror and writes horror, and I, I imagine your brain takes you to dark, dark places in terms of like storytelling. What's one of the most frightening stories you heard? It could be a book or a film. Something that genuinely unnerved you. I mean, the one that had a huge impact on me as a kid was um, Salem's Lot by Stephen King. The book or the... the originally with the TV show. Um, it was filmed in the 1970s. It was a, sorry, not a TV show. It was a TV movie in two parts. Oh. And actually, I, I saw... Originally, I just saw the second half. My next door neighbours knew I loved horror. And they saw the first part or saw that it was on. And they said to me, oh, there was this two-part horror film on the second part's on tonight or you know the next week whenever it was and so I thought oh, I'll watch that so the first half was very much slow burn and building up building up which it did excellently it's an excellent uh movie the second half just begins with a bang and keeps on going from there it's, <laughs> that was my introduction to the world of Stephen King and I was just horrified but in a brilliant way I absolutely loved it I went to bed that night I had nightmares about it but I loved having nightmares Sometimes parents will come up to me and say, I'm a bit concerned, Mr. Shannon. Uh, I'm worried your, your books might give my child nightmares. I say, well, I hope they do. <laughs> That's the whole point. If you read horror, it's because you want to experience those emotions. Yeah. Nobody can read a horror book by accident. There's none of my books that you pick up thinking, oh, this is a lovely, cute story about teddy bears. <laughs> very clear to the art of cover. <laughs> You're into sort of some very horrific territory here if you choose to go on. And we make that choice as readers. And yeah, I think we... In life, we find what we're drawn to. And people who are drawn to horror will seek out horror. People who aren't, we'll just put it aside. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah the, the, that scene in um, Salem's Lot where the, the boy comes back to life and taps on the window looking for, Daddy, let me come in. Yeah. That still freaks me out all these years later. Um, and I think that's that's probably where Certain Freak had its origins, the idea of telling it from a child's point of view. I can remember... Even before I saw that, so when I was living in London and my first few years here in Ireland, I used to um, think of scary things at night in bed to try and give myself nightmares. And I'd play out different scenarios. And vampires were always my favourite monsters. And so I used to think about, OK, imagine a vampire attacks. And I'd have a little uh, cross by my bedside cabinet. So I'd frighten it off. And sometimes I'd save my family. I'd be a hero who saved his families. And sometimes I'd dream about what it would be or imagine what it would be like if my parents got turned into vampires and I managed to survive because I had my cross and I knew what to do with my holy water. <laughs> and then occasionally I'd, I'd play around this idea of what would happen if I became a vampire. Mm. The idea of being a child and being this blood sucking monster, that sort of scared me, but intrigued me as well. And I think, you know, all those 20 years later, that's where a certain freak sort of came from. And your, your parents then, I mean, you're running around the house with a cross and you're, you're telling them that you're going to save them. Were they were they supportive of, of not necessarily going into the world of writing, but like the world of horror particularly? My, my mum, fair play to her. She, well, she probably let me have a bit too much of it. She was, um, yeah, she never sort of stopped me from buying a book or watching a film. She sort of let me. She knew I loved horror. She had absolutely no interest in it. But that was my thing. And so she supported me, let me off and... Yeah, so she was probably could have been a bit more censorious. As, as a parent of two young kids now, I sort of do look back and think, let me watch The Exorcist and The Omen when I was nine or ten years <laughs> of age. Sure, Mum, I don't know if that was good parenting. Perhaps 1980s, could do what you liked. <laughs> but yeah, she let me off. Um, when I saw the book of, of Salem's Lot in a bookshop, bookstore after I'd seen the TV show, it, it had a picture from the TV show on it. That's how I knew what it was. I said, Mum, Mum, can you buy it? Can you buy it for me? Um, she said, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it was, no, no, she was um, very, very supportive. She's, I often get you know, asked, who, who's your biggest influence in life? You know, who's been the most important person in terms of your development as a, as a writer? And it was definitely my mum. She never sort of blocked me from following where my twisted imagination was leading me. <laughs> That's so beautiful, though, and it's rare. My mom is the exact same. She's the exact same. When I was about 11 or 12, discovered horror. Mm -hmm. And like I said, she bought me all the books. When I wanted to move on to other series, she would support that. When I was like, I want to watch horror films, she sat down at me in broad daylight, even though she does not like horror. And she watched Dracula, Interview with the Vampire, The Lost Boys. She sat with me and watched all of them. And then when yeah. I was like, I'm good now, I can I can take the reins. She kind of let me off and supported yeah. us. Yeah. My mum was, was exactly the same. I think it's great when parents do that. We live in an age where it's, it's hard 
for parents to do that, I think, you know, because you can get support. You can get reported to Tusla if your kid goes into school now and starts talking about <laughs> yeah. ordering. You can. It's a sort of, um, you know, sort of strange times we live in, mostly better times. Um, there are certain things where I think, yeah, a little bit of a untoward behaviour in parenting isn't a bad thing. I think, you know, parents who recognise that. Oh, kids. Like my son, my, my son, Dante, he loves gaming. Always has done since he was like two, three years of age. You know, I've, I've no interest in that, but I let him do it. I let him off it because I know it's so important to him. I see his love of gaming is the same love I had for horror. Yeah. So obviously, I'm sort of I'm careful of what games he plays. I'm sort of thinking, yeah, you're probably not, not quite old enough for Red Dead Redemption just yet, <laughs> but Fortnite, off you go, my son. I think that that matters so much as well in terms of creativity and the development of somebody, and it shapes your interests and who you end up becoming. I you think know? so. I think. I think we have to let children find out who, who they are. We need to guide them. And it's it's hard, it's a hard, it's a hard path to tread. And you don't you're never gonna know exactly if you're doing it right or wrong until much until they're much further down the line. Um but you've got to go, you've got instinct. And you know, I I was very lucky. I had a lot I had parents who supported me, who let me sort of go my own way creatively and imaginatively. And yeah, I try and do that for my kids as well. And I have to know in terms of writing. <clears throat> as a creative person everyone has their own grooves they have their own rituals that you got to do to get into the mind space when you're actively working on a project do you like seclusion being by yourself do you like noise cancelling headphones do you like nature no I, I sort of um just come to the office and do it I never uh I always, I always have music playing whenever I'm writing I always like to have music playing in the background I find it your yeah, writing is very solitary and I find without music I'm aware of the silence I'm aware of being alone um, so I always would like, I wouldn't be hear, hearing much of it, but it would just be background noise. But that's important to me. But yeah, I'd, I'd never have a problem turning off. I'll come in, um, I'll do my bang, 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 bang on, on the computer keyboard, go and have my lunch, bang, 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 bang go and have my dinner and just just get on with things. Um, it's very rare that a book would get under my skin when I'm writing it. It's uh, it's just something like that. I, I, I treat it like a job. Even though it's a passion for me, it's my hobby. When it comes to writing, I always treat it like a job. You go in there, you got to put in the hours, you got to put in the hard work. Now, having said that, I haven't done much in recent years. Since my kids came along, I've sort of eased up a bit and had a bit of a mid-career break. Completely break, but you know, not as focused as I used to be. Um, now that they're both at school, I'm sort of getting back into the groove now of mm. doing the sort of work that I used to do before they came along. But yeah, I think you've got to, um, you've got to make yourself do it. I, I often say, when you're a writer, you work for yourself. And you've got to be a son of a bitch to work for. You've got to make yourself do it. You can't just, there are very few mornings I'd wake up and come trotting down to the computer. Oh, yes, great. I'm going to spend the next four or five hours writing words. It, it's like doing homework for the rest of your life. It's what it is. It's like, you know, you go into the room, you sit there, you're typing away. Obviously, it's homework of your choosing, which is a massive difference. But, yeah, it's not a, it's not always a very exciting job. Or a glamorous job. It's something you cut yourself off. You've got no one to talk to when you're doing it. Yeah, it can be quite lonely. It can be quite boring. If you're doing, working on a big, long book and there's those big middle section where, you know, the middles are always the hardest part of the book. You know, you, you, at the start, you reduce all the characters and the plot lines. Oh, it's all exciting. At the end, you bring it all together. It's all the action scenes. Oh, it's all exciting. You get those middles. And that's where the sort of good books live or die. It's how well the writer can handle the middle section. Uh, sometimes yeah, you're in those middle sections and it's like the doldrums at sea where there's no winds and you're just floating around and nothing's happening and there's no big fight scenes and you're thinking, why the hell am I doing this? What, oh, why did I start this in the first place? Oh my God, how long till the end? <laughs> and that's when you've got to make yourself do it. You can't, you've got to sort of force yourself, right, do your words today. Don't worry about being in the doldrums. Get your words done. Get them out of the way. You'll be 3,000 words further along tomorrow. And the day after that, you'll be another 3,000. I write about 3,000 words a day when I'm doing the first draft, which is quite a lot. Every write's different. It doesn't matter what, what, what it might be. It might be 100 words a day. It might be 500, whatever you're comfortable with. But if you hit your target every day and keep doing that, the book will tell itself. You will get to the end. And there's always a relief when you get to, get to the end. So, um, yeah, I sort of make myself do it. And, yeah, I've never been... I don't, every write's different. There's no one way of doing it. I know there are writers... And they get completely involved in it. And you have to do a fun a horror story. They sort of go all dark. And if they're doing this funny story, there might be all light and stuff. To me, it's um it never really makes much of a difference. Whether I come out of the room and I've dismembered an orphan a load of kids in an orphanage, or you know, I've written some nice, lovely romantic scene. It's much, much the same to me. 
Well, it's very comforting to know that you're not a method author. That is very comforting, given your source material. Some of the things that you've written are very comforting. Um, it would be rather worrying if I was. It would be a bit concerning. Without naming any names, was there a project that you thought you would never get finished, that you thought, I'm struggling here with this one? Uh, yeah. the, the hardest one was um, my most recent Archibald Locks, which oh. is a big, big, it's a big fantasy series. There were three volumes, nine short books, three volumes. But yeah, that was a real sort of, it was difficult because I wrote the first volume and I was really excited about it and really yeah. buzzed. And then I took it to my agent and he said, oh, I don't like this. And then I worked on it and worked on it, trying to change it. And he, no, no, I don't like this, don't like this, don't like this. And so eventually, you know, because we had such a good relationship, he took it to publishers, which normally he wouldn't have done if he, because he, you know, he, he would normally only support books that he really, really loved. So he took it and all the editors read it. No, oh, no, no, I don't like this. And so I sort of, uh, I was like halfway through, uh, I, I might have finished the second volume. I think I was sort of maybe starting work on the third. And I realised, you know, I had something I was going to have to start publish. I just... Even though I was this long established author who had you know sold twenty five million books, um, the publishing world had decided, nah, nah, we don't, we don't like this one, and that was a big, big sort of oh, low for me because you know it was certain freak, but certain freak. I was you know my my early mid twenties. I was young. I was foolish. I said, ah, what do they know? I'm going to keep on with this and I'm going to make it happen. You know, my mid forties. It was a bit more of oh my god, uh, <laughs> it's the end of my career. But I, I, I made myself do it. The third volume of Archibald Locks. Is the thing one of the things I'm sort of proud of because I really had to sweat and work hard to bring myself back. I put it aside for a couple of years. I'd written the first hundred pages, and I just sort of I lost faith in myself in the book. And I sort of just had a couple of years where I just sort of did nothing. But then I came back to it, and I made myself sit down, I made myself engage with it, and made myself write it. And, and it, it worked out really well. Yeah, you know, if you look at it, the reviews um, on that Amazon or Goodreads or anywhere else online. Uh, yeah, it went down really well. We just really liked it. It's very, very, been very, very popular. They sold quite well for self-published books. But yeah, that was a real, real grind for me because of outside factors that were were, were coming in. You know, so it was not not nice being told you've produced a dud, especially when I still don't think it was a dud, and readers don't think it was a dud who read it. But publishing world at that at that moment in time, it wasn't what they wanted from Darren Shan. So. We'll see. It might, it might pick up steam further down the road. Sometimes books get a second bite of life. I always think about um, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. And he wrote the first two of those back in the 50s. They did okay, but then they went out of print. Publishers, you know, for, for quite a few years, publishers had no interest in them. And it was only readers were looking for more. And over time, word of mouth started to spread. And he went back and wrote some more. And they became this huge success story. So, yeah, there, there are... Archie might have it to stay down the road. We'll see. But um, yeah, that was a very, very difficult one to to force myself to go through. I really had to put my I, I had to put my um, own principles to the test. That I've always said to write. I've spent you know twenty years saying to young writers, you, you've got to believe in the work. You've got to put it out. I, I was always saying, if I wasn't getting paid to write, I'd write anyway in my spare time. So this was the this was the test. Okay, we're not paying you to write. What are you going to do? And I, I made myself go there and write it and put them out. And since the Self-publishing then and and getting all these positive reviews. Now, I don't know what kind of person you are, but I'm the kind of person that would have to screenshot all those reviews and just send them on as an email through to the publisher to be like, oh, would you look at that? And it's, there's no point in that. They'll still... Stand I'm people in life. Once you've made up your mind about something, you make up your mind. You don't mm -hmm. sort of turn. It's like all those Donald Trump supporters... No matter what you might tell them about what he said, about what he's done, and they don't want to hear it. They just don't. And I, I used to post quite a lot on my blog about it because, you know, I'm, I'm quite, I was quite worked up about it. But I just realised there's absolutely no point. They will not be interested in that. They've got, they've made their opinion. And the same the publishers who decided Archibald Locks, they've got their opinion. It's it's not there. It's, it might happen to change that. Something might come along down the line. Um, for instance, if a, a, a movie director or, or writer wrote, read the books and thought, oh, yeah, I'd really like to turn this into a show or a movie or something. Then on the back of that, you might find, oh, yes, that's going to be a movie. Oh, yeah, we'll publish that. Yeah, so things can change. But no, I've never sort of, I, I respect their rights. Yeah, and some of the people who, who read it and didn't like it are people who I had good work relationships with. And yeah, it wasn't for them. Not everything is for everyone. That's sort of one of the things, one of the big lessons you've got to learn in life. You know, something that works for you might not work for anyone else. And everyone's entitled to their opinion of it. So if someone reads my book and goes, oh, not like that, I don't go, I don't take that personally. I don't go, what, what, what? You don't like my work? How do you bloody dare you? Ah, it's their opinion. 
and their opinion is every bit as valid as the person who does like like the work. Um, there's not everything I love. Yeah, I'm sure we, we probably have loads of common authors and movies that we would both love, but I'm sure there'll be some that you would be raving about, but I would hate, or I'd be raving about, and you would hate. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I had no problem with that. It was just, you know, it was disappointing for me because it's sort of this big block in terms of the book reaching as wide a readership as it could, re could reach. But no, no, I haven't been sending any screenshots to them. It, it's funny that you bring up um, that, that sort of very healthy relationship that you have with, well, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but especially when it comes to an artist, it's so personal and it's it's your yeah. little baby that you created and you send out into the world and you hope people treat it well. Um, yeah, but um, you, you can't control how people are going to react. Uh, I've been very, very lucky. So, yeah, you've got to look at the positives, negatives in life. You know, I've had incredible reactions to a lot of my works. So Certain Freak in particular, Demon Archer as well, The Fin Executioner, which is my favourite book out of all the ones I've written. And, you know, even though it hasn't sold as many as most of my other books, I'll be at events sometimes and someone will come up with Fin Executioner and say, well, this is my favourite book. And I go, yes, mate. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, you just, you can't control what people like. And you shouldn't want to control what people like. You do what, you tell the stories you want to tell. After that, you hope for the best of them. As you say, it's like children. It's like putting your kids out there. But yeah, the kids have to make their own way in the world. You know, with my two come of age and they head off, I can't live the life of them. You know, I can't make people buy my books. Um, I wouldn't want to live in a world where I could. It's sort of, you know, the books will, will find their way. Well, with the rise of social media, then, because when you, when, you when you got started writing, like you said, it was very much word of mouth, what you'd see in a bookshop. Things are very different nowadays, and and there is a level of connectivity that wasn't there before. How have you found navigating that? So I think it's brilliant. I love it. I was very tech savvy from the very beginning. Um, you know, I put my first website together. I had an old message board. I was always active on email and stuff, making myself easy for people to reach. I think it's a much richer world in many ways. So when I was growing up in nineteen eighties, you know, I didn't know what books were out there. You know, I used to go into my local library. The uh, O'Mahony's or Easton's in town. I didn't have much money, so I couldn't afford to buy new books. With libraries, you were sort of depending on what was in stock. Um, even with, if they had good books in stock, you didn't know what those good books were. You didn't sort of know, you know, there was no way to find out what the latest horror releases were. Um, nowadays, you can find that out online. You know, I like horror books. What's come out in the last year? Yeah. You have hundreds of suggestions. You can talk to other horror fans. So I had a couple of friends who were into the same sort of stuff I was into, and we'd connect and we'd chat about things. But you can find more now online so you might be you've grown up there might be no, none of your friends might be into that sort of stuff that's fine you go online who likes horror films <laughs> and you, you could now I, i've never been afraid of technology i think technology it has its dangers it has its perils most certainly but it for the most part it's making the world a more intriguing place where we can use if we use it for, for our own good we can get good things out of it obviously it can be a very bad thing as well and there's cyber bullying and there's all these things can happen um, but yeah, it's, it's a dangerous world. We're in a ball of rock flying around a big burning ball of gas. You know, this isn't a safe journey. We're going to have trouble along, along the way. Uh, and I think in life, we're defined a lot by how we deal with those troubles and how we turn the dangers to our own advantage. You know, fire is very dangerous. We learn to harness it and make it work for us. Um, we've got to, yeah, the fires of the dangerous written word and the internet. So I think, yes, we can get burnt. But if we don't, they make life a lot more interesting and enjoyable than it might otherwise be. That's gorgeous. Listen, I, I have taken up enough of your time. I want to just thank you so much for the art. And I know you get this a lot because you do. You go to a lot of conventions or signings or appearances. But truly, thank you so much for. I don't even think I realized how much of an impact that it did have on me until kind of recently looking back after reaching out to you that I genuinely think my love of horror began with your books and it, it spawned a lifetime of horror obsession I mean I have a YouTube now where I do videos on all things that I love and reaction videos and stuff like that but it it can all I guess I guess be traced back to Sexy Freak and the Demon Out series so thank you so so much and my love for reading that's wonderful to hear uh, I love that thank you so I hope you have a wonderful day with whatever it else that you may get up to I'm taking my mother-in-law in to rent a car <laughs> that's my job this afternoon I was not expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, go on, Darren. I'll let you go. Thanks a lot, Katie. No Take problem. care. And that is it for that chat, you guys. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I. It's it's funny because like if you say horror author to me, yeah, there's a part of my my brain that jumps straight to um. 
oh my god I'm saying my brain jumps straight through and then it just goes and we're jumping to nothing fucking Stephen King right my brain jumps straight to Stephen King or more recently Anne Rice because I've gotten into Anne Rice's works but Darren Shan was probably one of if not the most influential horror author on me I think it's fascinating as well getting to hear from that sort of brain you know because the acting or the directing process is so different to the writing process so I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did again big thank you to Darren for sitting and for talking oh this one was this one was crazy this 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 yeah this was an incredibly personal like achievement for me so I hope you enjoyed as always thank you so much for watching the links to all my socials and all of Darren's socials also I'll link all of his social medias down below and keep an eye out on my channel because there's more Halloween themed content to come.